Hello, welcome to yet another session of our NPTEL on nonlinear and adaptive control. I am Srikant Sukuman from Systems and Control IIT Bombay. We are well into our fifth week and we have been looking at uh, rather interesting notions on how to do convergence of parameter identification systems. Right. Uh, we are of course motivated by these very nice background images that uh, come up behind us and uh, this one is on, on a spacecraft which is orbiting the earth and uh, we hope that the algorithms that we design and the algorithms that we are analyzing uh, help us to uh, develop autonomy for systems such as these. So without delaying further, um, let's sort of look at what we were doing until the last session, right? So uh, we moved on to um, trying to prove exponential stability of a parameter, standard parameter identification system. So this system 7.1 uh, that you see here is actually very, very standard in uh, parameter update loss, yeah? so. So parameter update laws and the derivatives typically uh, look something like this in a lot of applications, right? So we are trying to use persistence of excitation of the signal phi in order to conclude that you have in fact, uh, you know, stable parameter convergence. That is parameters converge to the true values if you have some persistently exciting signal and so on, all right? So in order to do that, we uh, of course took a Lyapunov candidate, a valid Lyapunov candidate, and then we computed a V dot, which we found was only negative semi-definite. But when, since we are interested in using this alternate exponential stability theorem, we are not too worried. Right? So <clears throat> uh, we actually take the integral of this V dot, and this is what is this expression. So I'm going to highlight this again so that we can come back to this later. Right. Yeah, so we're going to come back to this later. So our subsequent attempts, like I said, are where to uh, try to get a bound on this one. How did we begin? We started from the use, uh, connecting the persistence of phi to UCO of this system. Right? So we showed that this system is in fact UCO. Uh, because of the persistence of phi itself. All right. So this is where we went. Yeah. So we want to, of course, start from here. And so let me mark this. So this is lecture 5.5. Yeah. So great. So now that we have established UCO of a particular system, we want to use the idea of uh, UCO being invariant under output injection uh, in order to get to our original system. Yeah, that's really the idea here. Okay. So what we do, what do we do for that? We consider a rather uh, interesting output injection term, right? Which is basically this uh, K of T is minus alpha phi. Right. So, of course, this is a vector. It is a vector of dimension n. Therefore, this k, the gain itself, is also a vector of dimension n. Yeah. Right. Great. Great. So, then if we compute, so one of the requirements for the output injection theorem was we had to compute a, a moving average bound. Suppose we do that. So, and that is what? It is basically integral from t to t plus cap t of this quantity. And I remember that uh, we we do have some kind of uh, persistence bound on this quantity. There is an upper bound on this quantity, and that's what we seek to use. Uh, it is well known that uh, I mean we use a rather well known equality, which is that non or uh, phi 
transpose phi or any vector for that matter is the same as trace of phi phi transpose. And this, of course, is non phi squared. Correct. This is a very standard equality. And right? so here we have a norm of phi square because the alpha square can anyway be pulled out. It's just a scalar quantity. Right? And the norm of phi square can be written as the trace of phi phi transpose. Right? Why do we do that? Because we have an outer product here and we want to see an outer product here. That's it. Yeah, so trace is just the sum of the diagonal elements. All right. So now if you know, if you look at this guy, you know that this is upper bounded by mu to i. So the trace of this okay, is upper bounded by mu two times n, right? So why? Why? Because again, we use the fact that trace of mu two times the identity matrix is just n mu two, okay, because this is an identity matrix of dimension n. Yeah. So if you just sum mu two on all the diagonals, you just get n times mu two. And that's what we get here, alpha squared n times mu. All right. So now that we have a nice upper bound on uh, this sort of a, the the output gain, yeah, we know that uh, a plus kcc is also UCO, right? So in this case, um, well, I mean, in this case, basically k is just the k of t, the small k of t. And C is basically just uh, phi transpose of T. Yeah. So if I substitute, right, so what do I get? A was zero, of course. Right? Just from here. A is zero. C is phi transpose. And k is minus alpha phi. So if I just substitute here, just from our injection output injection result, which says that if you have a nice moving average bounded k, then you cannot uh, destroy the UCO property if you do this output injection on the dynamics. Then essentially what we get is a plus kcc of UCO. And if I just substitute all these quantities in here, I will just get that minus alpha phi phi transpose comma phi transpose is in fact UCO. Okay. So what do we do? So we go back to our this nice integral. Right? I'm going to make this smaller so we can see both. You go back to this integral in equation 7.3, and that's what is rewritten here. Yeah, it's rewritten in the entire form. Right here, I had just here it's just written as a phi transpose x whole square, but here we expand it. Here we expand it, and right? that's all. And not just expand it, what else do we do? We write x in terms of the state transition matrices, right? So, which is what this is. I've written x as phi st uh, xt, right? So, x is, is phi st times xt. This is basically standard um, way of computing solutions for linear time varying systems using state transition matrices, right? So if you want the solution at S, you take the state transition matrix from S to T and then multiply it by the value at XT. Now the important thing to remember is that, and I do that on both sides, of course, right? So the important thing to remember is that these two quantities are now independent of the integration variable, and therefore I can move them outside the integration. That's what we do. And what you're left with inside is again our favorite UCO granule. Yeah, so this is what we like. We want to see the UCO gramian everywhere. Why? Because we are proving some kind of UCO condition and we're going to leverage it to bound this thing. Yeah, so remember, so this is what we have for our expression here, right, with the UCO gramian. And I also have that this system is now uniformly completely observable, yeah, which was obtained by where uh, output injection, right, through a nice game. Yeah, great. Now, what is this system? So that's what we want to do. We want to write this system out. Yeah, what is this dynamical system? This dynamical system is just this and this, yeah, because this is the a, this is the new C. This is the new A matrix, this is the new C matrix. 
Okay, this is not the old A C, but this is the new A and new C matrix. Right, so this is the dynamical system, and this is the output matrix. And what do I have? I have a system which looks like this. I have a system which looks like this. Now, notice what is this system? This is in fact the system that we are trying to prove uh, exponential stability of. Right. So this system. Is exactly this guy. The same system. All right, it's exactly the same system. Okay, and this is an output. This output is, of course, um, you can see that this is not a real measurement. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anybody would be able to claim that if I you know, used a sensor, I would measure something exactly like this. Yeah. So this is not like a sensor measurement. This is sort of an artificially created output so that you can complete your stability proof. That's it. Yeah, because we need an output injection. All right. That's all the purpose of using this Y. Yeah, this Y is not necessarily real measurement from a sensor. So let's not sort of, you know, uh, uh, we part the large cells and try to think that this is possibly some real measurement. It's not. I don't promise that it's any kind of a real measurement whatsoever. All I would say is it's just a construction for the purpose of analyzing stability here. Yeah, so the only thing we need to focus on is sort of this system. And that's good because this system is matching the system for which we want to prove stability. Now, what is the UCO gramian corresponding to this? I know that this system is already UCO. Yeah, with constants beta 1 bar and beta 2 bar. So what is the UCO gramian for this? The UCO gramian is T to T plus cap T uh, P transpose S tau sorry P transpose S T C transpose which is phi S C which is phi transpose S and the state transition matrix again in the DS. Yeah. So now let's look at this. And here the phi is corresponding to this system. And the phi corresponds to this system. Yeah, the phi is the state transition matrix of this system. Right? Now, if you look at this carefully, this expression. So what do I, anyway, before we do that, we know from the UCO criteria that this is less than or equal to some beta 1 bar identity and this is less than or equal to some beta 2 bar identity. And so I have a bound on both sides yeah, because of the UCO condition. Now, if you look at the Gramian expression here, you see that it is exactly identical to here. Yeah, is exactly the same. Yeah, because phi here is the state transition matrix corresponding to the original dynamics, which is this. And so is this. This phi is also the state transition matrix corresponding to the same dynamics. Right? And the matrix in the middle, phi and phi transpose, is of course, the same. Yeah. So now the fact that these two are exactly identical helps us to bound this guy because of the UCO condition I have a lower bound on this right? and because there's a negative sign that is what we need. we need the lower bound. So what do we have? We use this lower bound to actually upper bound V dot as minus 2 alpha beta 1 bar norm x t squared. There is no numbering in this, so to earlier try I would see. Or maybe I will just number it in sort of uh, 7.35. Let me call this equation 7.35. This is 7.35. Alright. So great. So I have an upper bound on the integral of v dot. Yeah, and this is exactly of the form that we require in our alternate exponential stability theorem, right? And so, great. I have, in fact, proved that the 
equilibrium x equal to 0 for this sort of parameter identifier system is in fact uh, exponentially stable right and this of course we have leveraged uh, persistence of excitation uco and uco under output injection to do all this yeah so and as i had mentioned before the why that we actually see is purely for analysis purposes. Yeah, there is no role of why or, or there is no real measurement uh, which can possibly resemble why. All right. So it's purely for the purpose of analysis. So yeah, just think of it as an artificial construction. Yeah. Now there are also extensions of these, which is again something which appears very commonly in model reference adaptive control parameter identifiers. Right. And that is this, uh, excuse me, not a time invariant system, so this is linear time varying system. Yeah, if you look at this linear time varying system, which is again something that uh, is very common in, in model reference adaptive control, error here is basically some kind of a tracking error or because it's a model reference system. So E is the error with the model reference typically. So that's what is mentioned here. Is that called it? Uh, no, I'm yeah. So tracking error e, and then you have a parameter estimation error theta t. Yeah, and usually this is the dynamics that you find. You will find like a uh, sort of an interesting dynamics where you have an a is basically the origin coming from the original system itself. No problem. Uh, b times phi is basically the dependence on the parameter. Yeah, because because there's a parameter error that is and it's an unknown parameter, so there is no way I can cancel the parameter term. So I sort of try, do the best, and so I get a, something in the parameter error, and I get something uh, in the update law, which is depending on the e on the tracking error. Yeah, so this is very standard, very standard in model reference adaptive control. When we get to that stage, you will see that our system uh, turns out to be of this form okay now further if you consider so therefore we are considering this linear time varying system right um, further if we have a b to be a controllable pair very standard assumption and a c to be an observable pair again a standard assumption uh, further if there exists a uh, you know, for, for a given positive definite symmetry q there exists a positive definite symmetric p such that this Lyapunov equation is satisfied and this PB equal to C transpose if both of these happen. Um, but, and phi is absolutely continuous in phi phi dot. Right? Then you have that the origin of this system is uniformly globally exponentially stable if and only if phi is persistently excited. Okay, so this a uh, lot of different points here. So this these two I would say are like standard assumptions and linear systems standard assumptions in linear observer and control so nothing special about this this is very standard assumption in linear systems observer and control design so it's not like there's something uh, too new that we are sort of you know like uh, introducing here the next condition here is like a exactly like a Lyapunov equation corresponding to A B full widths. Yeah, so if your A matrix is a full width matrix, yeah, it's a stable matrix then this sort of an equation is always satisfied yeah if a is a stable matrix a Hurwitz matrix which is usually the case here yeah then this sort of an equ Lyapunov equation can always be satisfied this is the sort of uh, converse stability theorem for linear systems all right yeah converse Lyapunov theorem for linear systems now this condition is basically like a standard what i would call a matching condition so this is sort of additional this is a matching condition and of course this um, 
we, we have not really defined what absolute continuity is. So I would ask you to look up the definition. But the purpose purpose of fee being absolute continu absolutely continuous is just so that uh, you know persistence excitation etc are well defined yeah, because in order to do persistent excitation you need to uh, take an integral and so on and so forth so so essentially we um, require phi to be absolutely continuous and we also require phi and its derivative to be bounded okay. so this is a stand this is a very again like a more uh, I would call a regularity assumption so that so that things are well defined that's all yeah so that things are well defined all right so so then if we have these four conditions like you know um, i would say relatively reasonable conditions yeah then you can actually claim that z uh, equal to zero that is the zero equilibrium uh, is in fact uniformly globally exponentially stable if and only if phi is persistently excited. So this you can see is an extension of the previous result. Uh, the nice uh, cool thing here is that um, you, when you say z, z is basically both these states together. You are saying not only do the tracking errors converge, but the parameters also converge. Yeah. So this is not very common in adaptive control. Yeah. Let me be honest. In a lot of cases, when we solve adaptive control problems, you would, and we will do that very soon, you will start to see that parameter convergence is not usually guaranteed in adaptive control. Yeah. All an adaptive control theorist will tell you is that in the presence of an uncertainty, by designing a parameter estimator, what we can guarantee is that your tracking error that is your control objective, which is say, for example, your robot wants to move in some kind of a sinusoidal shape. Yeah. Um, so, so basically, this kind of a tracking objective will be precisely met, no problem, even with the parameter uncertainty. But identification of the set parameter may not happen. Yeah. And that is where there is this requirement of persistence of excitation and so on. And also here to the, the theorems that you have and right? the conditions that you have or the theorems that you have are rather limited in terms of uh, you know what kind of systems they can handle because if you notice the two results that we saw are in fact only for linear systems yeah? it is not really that easy to come up with such conditions when your dynamics is non-linear all right and that's what we are usually dealing with. We're usually dealing with non-linear systems. Yeah. So uh, there is still a lot of um, open problems in, in trying to talk about parameter convergence for non-linear systems. Yeah. So uh, adaptive identification of parameters, that is precise identification of parameters is not guaranteed in adaptive control. Yeah. There are only these few cases where, in fact, you have some results which under uh, which typically work under persistence of excitation uh, and they guarantee that you know your parameters will also converge to the true value right on top of tracking errors going to zero so tracking errors going to zero is guaranteed by all adaptive control and that's what most practitioners are interested in anyway yeah they don't care about really identifying and noting down parameters sure but in some cases yes you are also interested in doing that because once you identify the parameters precisely enough and if they stay fixed uh, you can implement simpler controllers subsequently and not uh, would not need to implement adaptive controllers. Yeah, so this is uh, sort of what, um, you know, uh, is the conundrum in adaptive control, of course. Yeah, it provides a nice solution, but it also leaves something out there open to work. Yeah, great. So, so one of the other points, the final points on this uh, additional result is that this condition three that you have, that is this sort of condition, it it actually helps you to, uh, you know, ensure that this Lyapunov function works. Okay, and it's not very difficult to verify. I mean, we can actually take a very nice simple derivative here. Uh, 
so so v dot from here becomes e transpose uh, p wait e transpose p e dot so this is i believe a constant p variable right because a is absolute a is a constant matrix so we have yeah it will have well i'm going to write it out e transpose p e dot plus e dot transpose p e plus theta tilde transpose theta tilde dot okay and this if i substitute for e dot from this guy here right so what will i get i get e transpose p a e plus b phi transpose theta tilde plus same thing e transpose a transpose plus theta tilde transpose phi b transpose times p e plus theta tilde transpose and theta tilde dot is just minus phi c so minus theta tilde transpose phi times c as usual i have sort of gotten rid of all the time arguments right so if you look at uh, just this two together this becomes e transpose e a plus a transpose p e yeah and then i'm left with uh, right right then i'm left with uh, plus uh, twice in fact i'm going to combine them theta tilde transpose uh, phi b transpose p e i missed an e here right so so i don't think we should have an half here and so there should be a minus twice here and so this is minus twice theta tilde transpose phi times c times e right so this of course is nice minus e transpose q e from a lyapunov equation and these two in fact cancel out right how this is by virtue of the fact that uh, we have this set of a condition p b equal to c transpose so if you see this P B equal to C transpose, so C is equal to B transpose. P. So these two are the same, so they actually cancel. So we are left with this kind of a minus C transpose Q E, and this is our usual starting point. If you remember, right, this is where uh, you have V dot is negative semi definite, and you start to integrate V dot, and you know you go on with the proof. So we are not completing the proof for this case. Yeah, you can look up the proof. Uh, this is this work is by Narendra sometime in 1977-78, I believe. Yeah. So you can look up the proof if you wish, but this is the starting point you remember. We have a negative semi-definite V dot. We start to integrate the V dot, start to use P, U, C, O, and all such conditions on phi, and then we sort of you know. Try to go on from here. So I would strongly recommend that you try to see how you can complete this. Great. So what did we look at today? We uh, completed the proof for parameter identifier convergence under persistence of excitation. We saw how we could leverage uh, the PE, UCO, UCO under output injection, this alternate exponential stability theorem. So basically all the neat little results that we looked at from the beginning of this week 
we could leverage that to actually prove that uh, you have this parameter identifier convergence. Right? We also saw an extension of it, right? Where you have this sort of a system which contains the tracking error E from the model reference adaptive control setting, which you will look at in the future, and also the theta tilde. So you had both the E dynamics and the theta tilde, that is the parameter error dynamics. And we claimed that uh, theta and E tilde are exponentially, uniformly, globally exponentially stable at zero. If this, again, this phi type of a gain term is phi t is in fact persistent to the second. And then we saw what kind of conditions are required for that. Thank you. So anyway, we'll uh, continue more on uh, this way. I mean, try to wrap up this sort of material uh, in the next session. And yeah, that should be an interesting discussion. All right. Thank you folks.